Thanks, Marianne. Thanks, kids. We, uh, we're going to listen to Jesus right now. Um, God comes to us through his word, and so we're going to do that uh, right now. I know that you have been uh, working through a series in Philippians, uh, and today, we're, now that you've been finished uh, with that series, we're going to kind of, today's kind of a bridge between your series in Philippians and between next Sunday, which starts into the church season of Lent. And uh, we're going to read um, two passages today, and uh, I'm going to read both of them for you because, and I want you to listen closely because they're both about things that happen on mountains. The first one is from Exodus chapter 24, and uh, you'll have the, the, the reading up on the screen if you want to follow along there. Uh, if you want to follow along in your pew Bible or in the Bible that you brought with, it, with you, that would be just fine as well. Now, I think... I think what's going to happen here is very similar to what happens in our congregation, is that the software we use to build the the screen, the the service on the screens, uses a bit of a different translation than the Pew Bibles. And so I'm going to read out of the Pew Bible. The words might not be exactly the same if you're following up on up on the screen, uh, but they'll be very very close. So they'll be they'll be close enough that it won't be like trying to hear everybody at the same time. It it still will be understandable, okay? So we have Exodus 24, and we're going to read verses 8 through 18. Moses then took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his, pe- under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commands I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aid, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up onto the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain. And he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. This is God's word for us this morning. And then we're also going to read from Luke chapter 9, which is the, one of the uh, accounts of what we call the transfiguration. And transfigure is a big word that means change. Okay? So we're, gonna, we're going to uh, see a, a reading about change. And this is from Luke chapter 9, and we start at verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, which is referring back to some of his teachings from before, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. This is the gospel of our Lord for us this day. Well, Marianne was right. Um, This is an amazing story of a time when something really out of the ordinary happened. I've been spending some time with my congregation, our congregation in Penticton. Um, After Christmas, 
we get into this church year season called Epiphany, which means revealing. And so we've been making connections. And we made connections between the Christmas season and this new church year season. We have been making connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and through it all, we've been seeing how God is connected to us in His Word and how we as a church are connected with each other. And today I, I get to make a connection with you. I, I've met some of you, a, a few of you before the service here, and I don't know you all all that well, but I get to connect with you today in, in a way that is very special. I get to make a connection in the Scriptures with you today as well, as we hear these readings from Exodus 24 and Luke, Luke 9, and we also see that account happening in Matthew and Mark's gospel as well. And we get a connection between seasons in the church year, like I said earlier. Today is this day in the church year that's called Transfiguration Sunday, or Change Sunday, if you want to use a little more common word. And, and our readings for today are connecting us to the glory of God, where we see this picture of Jesus being changed as we read in, in Luke chapter 9, that, that Jesus, when he was alive on earth and doing his earthly ministry, to look at him, you wouldn't have necessarily known just by looking at him that he was any different. He wore the regular kind of dress, the clothes of the day. He spoke the same language that they did, all of those kinds of things. But now you get this glimpse this place where Jesus is changed, and they describe him as, as glowing, as shining, as bright as a flash of lightning or like the sun. It's not something that Peter, James, and John would have got to experience every day. This happened, it, it seems fitting, right, that this, was ha this would happen on a mountain. We see the same kind of thing happening in Exodus 24 where the presence of God comes down on the mountain and Moses goes up to the very presence of God in this mountaintop experience. I don't know about you, but I love mountains. Um, I grew up in Regina, Saskatchewan, where there are no mountains, right? The joke about places like Regina is they're the places on earth where you can watch your dog run away for three days, right? Like it's, it's that flat, I learned to ski on this place, at this place called Mission Hill, which is really just like a little bump, really. I mean, it's not a mountain. In fact, it, it doesn't even go up from the land. The land goes down into a bit of a valley, and Mission Hill, the ski area, is kind of down on that into the valley. Like, it's this tiny little place. And so I'm fascinated by mountains. Uh, we've been in the Okanagan area for a while now. We've been surrounded by smaller mountains. But, but here in Vancouver, I've loved being close to big mountains. And I've loved the days, especially when it's sunny and you can see Mount Baker. Now, I, I know I'm not from here, but I got to tell you, you, you have this reputation in Vancouver where, it, especially in the winter, it rains like every day, right? Like that's, that's kind of the stereotype of Vancouver. But it's been interesting to be here for a couple months and to see days that have been completely cloudless, sunny, and days like today, which are very reminiscent of Regina or the Okanagan or whatever it is with snow coming down. I mean, this, I'm, I'm told this is abnormal, right, for Vancouver. Is that, is that true? Yeah, generally. It's, it, but I've, I've got like three seasons here in the two months that I've been here. It's been fantastic. I've loved being able to see Mount Baker. Like there's just this huge majestic mountain rising in the, on the horizon when, when it's uh, sunny enough to see it. Driving between here and Penticton, you have to go over and around the mountains. I'm, I'm fascinated by mountains. Penticton has some smaller mountains. It's a beautiful place to live. If you've been there, you know we have a lake on the north end of town, the lake on the south end of town. It's a great place in the summer. There are mountains around, but they're not this big. And so it's been fascinating being here. When we're driving to Children's Hospital... Uh, we're staying at a place that's on Fraser and 55th in the southern part of Vancouver. And so I drive north on Oak Street and just coming over the crest around 41st, just after 41st, you kind of see downtown Vancouver and then the mountains in the background. It's a beautiful view when I'm heading to the hospital most, uh, whenever I'm heading there, which is almost every day. Mountains have this, this place of grandeur in our world, right? We get, we're surrounded by them here, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. We see mountains in our readings, both in Exodus and in Luke 9 today, and you get to experience God 
through these readings today, the people there experienced God in a way that was just not every day, right? That doesn't happen every day. I want to kind of zoom into that text in, in Luke 9 just for a minute. And Marianne did a great job of kind of showing or setting the stage of, of what was there. So they're up on this mountain, they're praying, Peter, James, and John, which are three of Jesus' 12 disciples, and they're the ones that kind of, they, they experience these really intimate things with Jesus that not everybody gets to experience. And then all of a sudden they see that Jesus is changed, and they see something really different about Jesus. And then, if that wasn't enough, Moses and Elijah, who lived hundreds and thousands of years before this, show up and they're talking with Jesus. I mean, just, we can't even really picture that, can we? But it happens. And Peter, James, and John are there, and you would think that if ever there was a time to just kind of sit back and take it all in, that this would be the time. Right? Like If you're Peter, James, and John, and you've got Jesus there who's glowing like the sun, and you have Moses and Elijah just show up out of nowhere, and they're just talking. And they're talking specifically, as we read about it in Luke 9, about his departure. It talks about that, they're, that Jesus is going to depart. And the, here's a, a little connection that I want to make with you today from Exodus to Luke. That they're talking about his departure. And in the original language of the Bible, of the New Testament in Greek, that word for departure Any guesses what that word for departure might be? I just gave it to you a minute ago. I'm hearing murmurs. Exodus. The the Greek word, this is where we get the name of the book of Exodus. It means exit or departure. It's the same word. So you have Moses connected with Jesus here. Moses being most well known for the exodus from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt. Moses leads the people out of slavery in Egypt. So you have Moses there talking with Jesus about his exodus. You have Elijah, who's one of the great prophets, talking together with Jesus. So there's this connection happening between Moses, the Old Testament, kind of the the big figures of the Old Testament with Jesus himself. And Peter Peter is Peter. If you know anything about Peter... I love Peter. He's impetuous. He's rash. He's the guy that jumps out of the boat and starts to sink and needs to be rescued by Jesus. He's the guy that just, he acts without thinking, right? Uh, Maybe some of you can relate to that. This is Peter. And Peter, who's just overwhelmed by what's going on, and he doesn't know what he's saying. Luke even gives us that. He said he didn't know what he was saying. He was at that point where he felt like, I'm not quite sure what to do, but I got to do something, right? Have you ever had that feeling? And so he says, Lord, it's good for that we're here, that meaning me and John and James. It's good that we're here because we can build tents for you because like, we want to stay here a while, right? If you have Moses, Elijah, and Jesus together, you want to kind of make that last. And so Peter's kind of grasping a little bit, but he says, okay, let's stay here. We'll make tents so that you can be comfortable. And then we hear this voice from the cloud, which again takes us back to Exodus 24. And this voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Matthew adds a little more detail on that. He says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Which echoes back to the the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, which is another fascinating connection. We just, we don't have time to dig into that one today. But they hear this voice and they tremble in fear and Jesus comes over to them and says, stop being afraid. Get up, rise, come with me. And he leads them down off the mountain. And if we, we kind of have zoomed into that reading a bit, if we zoom out just a little bit to the text and the story of what's going on in Jesus' life, this happens just after he has, he has predicted that he is going to suffer and die. And Peter, as we read about it in Matthew 16, Peter, you remember Peter's reaction, for those of you who know the story, when Jesus says, I'm going to have to suffer and die, and Peter, who has just confessed Jesus to be the Son of God, takes him aside and says, nah, Jesus, that's not going to happen. 
You shouldn't have to suffer and die. That's not the way this is supposed to work. And as we kind of zoom out a bit to Jesus' life, we see that Jesus is headed down the mountain into the valley because he's headed for the cross. And we have this Sunday today because it's just before the next season in the church year, which is the season that prepares us for the cross again, the season of Lent that begins again on Wednesday. And so Jesus is predicting that he has to suffer and die, and Peter's wrestling with this. And Jesus is taking them down off the mountain into the valley on the road to the cross. And multiple times as you read the story, he begins to predict that again and again. He tells them over and over, the Son of Man is going to have to suffer and die. Now, if any of you who are movie buffs, the Oscars are tonight, right? It's kind of the big night in Hollywood. In the movies, we would call this foreshadowing, right? It's, it's even more than foreshadowing. It's really, it's an outright prediction. Jesus says, this is what's going to happen. And he says it over and over and over again. And we see where this is going in the, the story of Jesus' life and earthly ministry, that he's headed to the cross. He continues his ministry for a little while longer, and then he's headed to the cross, as we zoom out even just a little bit further, not in the biblical text, but in our Christian lives, we see that this is our path in this time of year as well. We are headed to the cross again. And this journey that we're going to go on is, is kind of like coming down off of a mountaintop and going into the valley, into the time when we prepare ourselves once again to remember in a very intentional and specific way the death of Jesus. But there's a mountain on the other side of that too, isn't there? A hill called Calvary where Jesus died for us. And it's readings like this, it's places like this where we actually get the phrase, the mountaintop experience. Right? You've probably heard that. You might have described a really good thing in your life as, I, I had a mountaintop experience. Well, this is one of the challenges of our life because the world likes for us to live from mountaintop to mountaintop. Right? The, the world likes for us to live in, in the highs of life, the high points of life, and to, to focus on those. I know that uh, some of you in your congregation go down to Creation Fest You've been down there before almost every year. I think a group goes down there to this big music festival. I've been there a, a few times, and it's a fantastic place, isn't it? For those of you who have been there, you could probably safe, safely describe it as a, a mountaintop experience. The problem is, with mountaintop experiences, they're, sometimes they're few and far between. And we tend to think, we buy into this lie that the mountaintop experiences are where real life happens. And so we look for these mountaintop experiences to, to kind of hang on to, just like Peter did. Maybe for some of you, it's not a yearly thing like Creation Fest. Maybe some of you are in a job that you don't really enjoy and you live from Friday to Friday because those are kind of the mountaintops because the work week is over and the weekend is coming. Or maybe life is getting faster. We know this in our, in our world. Maybe some of you live text message to text message. Or Facebook status to Facebook status. How many likes did I get on this one today? See, we, we, we really like those highs. We, we love the rush of the mountaintop events. We, we, do, we don't know what to do or say all the time there, but we have to do something, so we look for the next one. But the problem is, we have to come down off the mountain. Those things don't last. And we crash. And we, we see the shine come off. The, the weekend comes to an end. The, the novelty or the euphoria wears off and we crash. And we look for the next fix. And if it sounds like I'm speaking in language that's similar to addiction, well, I, I am. Because we're, we're addicted to it, aren't we? We're addicted to the highs of life. We're addicted to the rush. We're addicted to the glory. And we, we can't wait to get to the next one. And many times we also buy into this lie in our sinful nature that that's 
where Christian life is, is on the mountaintop. And that these valleys of life are, are not something that should be part of our Christian life. That our Christian life, if we have Jesus, should be easy and pain-free and glorious. Dear friends, it's a lie. It's mountaintop to mountaintop is the way so many of us live our lives. And we think that that's where it should be. That's where we find our meaning. That's where we find our purpose. And we forget that real life is lived in the midst of everyday, ordinary, and even extraordinary suffering. Things are not always easy. We experience loss. We experience brokenness. We experience pain. That's where Jesus meets us. He says, rise, come with me. I'm meeting you in your valleys. I'm here with you. And if you think about this scene on that mountain, it really is amazing the connections that are made. You think about Jesus with Moses. Moses is the one who received the law from God and then gave it to the people. And he's there with the one who will ultimately fulfill the law that God's people could never fulfill in their sin. Moses is the leader of God's people who walked them through the the miraculous dry bed of the Red Sea out out of slavery in Egypt, appears there talking with the one who will lead us out of slavery to sin and death. Elijah is that great prophet. And a prophet is one who speaks for God. And he's there as a prophet. He's appearing with the one who isn't just speaking for God, but is very God himself speaking. Elijah, the messenger that was promised by Malachi. His ministry was fulfilled in John the Baptist, and John is Jesus' cousin, and John points to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You've got this amazing picture, the connections that are being made. And in the midst of all of these connections, it really comes down to what your congregation has said in its mission and vision and its values. You've got posters out in in the entryway there that articulate it so well. It's all about Jesus. That Moses and Elijah were leading towards Jesus. I tell my congregation that all of the Bible is about Jesus. Jesus. The Old Testament points forward to Jesus. The gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they reveal Jesus. And the rest of the New Testament points back to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And Jesus is speaking today. He's speaking in our text. He's speaking to us even now by his word. And as we listen to Jesus this morning, he's telling us that he is truly God. And he's pointing us to the cross once again. He's showing us just a glimpse of his glory today. We just, we just get a glimpse just like Peter and James and John did. He's showing us that one day he will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. But right now, our lives are lived connected to the cross. As you listen to Jesus this morning, some of you are like Peter. You're impetuous, You're ready to to just stay there on the mountaintop and stay in glory. Some of you are wrestling with this notion of suffering and pain and loss and death and what place that has in the Christian life. As you listen to Jesus this morning, some of you maybe have felt knocked down. You know that you can't stand on your own two feet before your God. You know your brokenness. You know that you've been living from high to high. You're seeking only glory, but you know that you're broken. I want you to hear Jesus this morning, wherever you find yourself. I want you to hear him say, rise. Don't be afraid. Come with me. We're we're about to walk a road here that is not going to be easy, but I am with you in the midst of it. I want you to hear Jesus this morning. It's not time to stay on the mountain. It's time to be in everyday, ordinary life knowing that Jesus is with you every step of the way. 
friends, if, you're, if you feel today like you're on a mountaintop, that, that, you know, life is good and you've got lots of things to celebrate, you need to know that valleys are coming. And you need to know that your Savior is with you in the midst of those valleys, that He will never leave you or forsake you. If you're feeling like you're, you're in one of those valleys right now, know that there is a hill that's coming. And it's called Calvary. And it's where your Savior took upon all of your sin and died for them. And we're on now living on the other side of the cross, but we're still connected to Him. He connects you to your God. He leads you out of slavery and into His glorious freedom. And he gives you not just one mountaintop experience to to want to stay there, but ongoing transformation as you live every day, knowing that your God is with you. And he gave himself for you. And so hear Jesus today. Listen to Jesus today. He has words of life for you. And those words of life are rise, be not afraid. Come with me. We're heading into the valley, but I am with you. Would you pray with me? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that you have given us a glimpse of your glory on this day. That as we come in your presence today, we, we don't see your son face to face like Peter, John, and James did, but We hear your voice today. We're gathered together as your people and we know who your son is and what he's done for us. And on this day, we pray that we would be able to hear his voice loudly and clearly. That in the midst of everyday life, we know that you are with us. We thank you for that. And we pray that you would strengthen us today as we listen to you again today. That you would be with us in the midst of every circumstance of life. That you are with us in our celebrations, in our mountaintop experiences, but you are also with us in the midst of pain and suffering and grief and death and loss. We thank you this day. And we pray that you would continue to give us your spirit to walk each day in your light and in your love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.